scripture, but we're going to get through it. All right, so here we go. The title of this is Real Faith or Not. Two things that I want to ask us that we're going to learn from the book of James as a whole. What are we going to learn? One, we learn the relationship between faith and works. Faith and works. Now, a lot of people struggle with this concept of grace and faith and then works, but they actually work together. God does save us by grace, but real grace produces works in our life. It will produce fruit. A fruit tree will produce fruit. So our lives, if we are people of faith, will produce working faith. Okay. Number two, we explore the impact of our faith on our life and our city in the world. So what does our faith do as we go out into the world? Now, as I told the students, the book of James has a way, and I've heard Bill talk about this, it just has a way of slapping you around. It's got a way of just coming along and getting to the point. He wastes no time, he just says it, and then you've got to deal with it. Okay, So that's what we're going to talk about. But specifically, what I want to address tonight is the first 18 verses. And all these first 18 verses have everything to do with what do we do with the tough stuff in life. What do we do when life goes wrong? What do we do when life gets really hard? So we are going to study that. We're going to read that. So go ahead. Uh, so the couple of slides. So there's the two things. And then the next one. All right, here we go. What do we do with the tough stuff of life? So I gave you one of these sheets. This is exactly what we do in youth group. It gives them a way to follow along and to study along as I'm teaching. So take that and follow along with me. And so here we go. James chapter 1, 1 through, uh, let's start with verses uh, 1 through 4. Let's start it right there. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So here's what James starts out. Here's the very first thing he is just going to smack us with. He's just going to get right to the point. Okay, now I have three things laid out, and the first question is going to deal with this. Here's three things I want you to think about as we study this. As a people of faith, what is our response to this tough stuff in life? Number two, what is the relationship between testing and temptation where do we and God fit in that? Number three, is God really good? If yes, how do we know that? Okay, so number one, the first one we're going to answer. What do we do about this tough stuff in life? James gives us a command right away. Count it all. Sorry, guys, this mic is, I'm having to hang on my t-shirt. Uh, count it all joy. Now, I love what Will says. You study the Hebrew, the Greek, the Greek in this case, and you look up the word all, and guess what it means in the Greek? All. You count it all joy. You count every bit of it joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, this is a big challenge. Because I know, and you know, and I tell the students, they don't have to be alive very long to figure out that life gets really tough. In fact, if I were to sit down here tonight and I were to go through a list of people and the things they deal with and the things they've gone through, we can make a really big list really quickly of some rather hard stuff. We just heard a prayer request about a young girl that lost her life and lost the baby in the process in a car accident. Imagine what that family is going through. Imagine the death. You know, even just talking to Ben... As Ben is a firefighter, and we sit down, and he'll start just telling me about all the stuff that he sees and does. Within about 15 or 20 minutes, I'm just like, I don't even, I do not understand how he, in such a young age, is able to deal with that and comprehend it and to process it. Life is really hard. And yet, James has the audacity. I want you to think about this. This is not just something we read and we just say, okay, amen, yeah, that's great. James says, count it all joy. In fact, I, I read that and I'm kind of offended at first. Like, what do you mean, Jay? You're telling me. And now I do want to stop right here. And I want to say, 
Sometimes you can say the right truth at the wrong time. And I would not recommend walking up to somebody who has just gone through a horrific event and say, well, brother, you should just count it all joy. I don't think that would be good for that person. I don't think it would be right for that person. Okay, But nonetheless, Paul says, for me and you, people of faith, count it all joy, but there's going to be a reason for that. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces, and now the translations are all different here, but the ESV says steadfastness or patience. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So what is the purpose of the trial? What is the end game? What is the end goal? What is it all for? What is it all about? Here's what it's all about. God is trying to make you into something. In fact, he is really trying to make you into the image of his son. God is trying to make you perfect. God is trying to make you complete. So how can James say, count it all joy? It's as simple as this. In the hard times, in the tough stuff of life, you know what I found out is this already in 37 years is I never really have grown when things are easy. When things are easy and I just kind of get complacent. When things are easy, I kind of put things in neutral and I kick back and I just go along for the ride. But when things get tough, that is when I really start growing. In fact, I've heard a saying that something to the effect of easy times produce soft men, which lead to tough times that produce hard men. And, 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 and there's this cycle. That is a truth that hard times, the tough times of life, produce the best in us. That's when we grow. Just like being physically fit. You don't, you don't, uh, you don't get ripped by sitting on the couch watching Netflix and eating you know, uh, Twinkie bars. Like, that's, not how you, that's not how you get fit. And being, becoming spiritually fit, letting your faith grow, doesn't come by spiritually sitting on the couch and just kicking back and putting your life in neutral. It comes during the tough stuff of life. And so James says, count it all joy. Count it all joy because the end goal is that you're going to be like me. Me and Emily have had this conversation about marriage. And, you know, I heard a pastor once say, He'll have people come to him. I know Will's probably had this. She's just not the right person for me. He's not the right person for me. They're completely different than me. And this pastor says, I look at those people and I say, duh. Do you think God is going to put you with somebody that's just like you? So that you cannot be conformed to the image of Christ? So you can No, he is going to put somebody. In fact, if you look at most marriages, you've got one person way over here, and you guys who are married know this, and you've got the other person way over here. All you have to do is look at me and Emily. I'm way over here, and Emily's way over here. But yet God has used her struggles to make me more like Christ. And God has used me in a great way in her life to hopefully make her more like Jesus. Amen. That is the point of what God's point for your marriage is not so that you have happiness. God's point for your marriage is so that you're more like Christ. And so we come in, well, I, I, I fell out of love with her because, you know, she's just not the right person. I think Jesus would look at us and be like, duh, I put you with somebody that is going to make you more like me. Quit fighting against that and grow to be more in my image. Count it all joy so let's do what the students do number one our trials are never outside of God's control our trials are never outside of God's control number two we can have joy in trials because God is using them to make us more like Christ okay but then he moves on in verse five he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But watch this, verse 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, you have, James kind of likes to almost jump around. 
It's like, James, how did you go from talking about trials and now you're talking about wisdom? But what you need to understand is him talking about wisdom has to do with trials. So what is he saying? He's saying when you go through trials, if you lack wisdom in the, in the area of why am I going through this? What, what's going on here? He's, what does he say? Let him ask of God. But when that person does, let him ask in faith. For a person who doubts is like a man who is tossed by the waves of the sea. So here's what he's saying. When you're going through those tough times in life, when you're going through those trials in life, when your marriage is breaking down, when the kids aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, when your business is failing, when your job is going under, whatever life is throwing at you, Paul says, or no, sorry, not Paul, James says, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you have access to the very wisdom of God. You can pray about it. Now, what I do not think he is saying here, let me be very clear. I do not always think that God will give you a very specific answer as to here's exactly why you're going through this. All you have to do is study the, like, the book of Job to find that out. But here's what God will do. I think God will show you how he is using this in your life to make you more like Christ. And all you have to do is tap into the wisdom of God and know and expect. I love this is yet again where James just cuts to the point. He says, when you come to God and you ask for wisdom, don't doubt. Remember, he's the God that he just said he's the God that gives it generously. This is like, you know, we went to the movies the other night and I, you know, I went and got popcorn and I sat down and I realized that the guy that put the butter on there didn't do it very generously. I looked at Taylor, who was sitting beside me, Taylor Jones. I said, I think I'm about to go get some more butter. She said, I think you should. So I got up. Well, I should have just let the guy go with what he did because at the end of the movie, I was about sick to my stomach from all the butter I had put on it. So, but God gives generously. He pours it on. He says, I will give you this. I will give you wisdom. I'll help, I'll help you understand. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit, as we talked about on Sunday. Don't doubt, just simply ask, and I will provide that wisdom in the midst of that situation. So number three, during trials, we have access to the wisdom of God. We must simply ask and trust God to answer. But then we move forward. Yet again, it seems like Paul is going to switch from second gear to third gear, like he's just going to change subjects. You can go to the next slide. Title of this slide, what do we do with tough stuff in life? We're still working through that. Verse 9. Let the lowly brother exalt in his exaltation, and let the rich man in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So, yet again... All that we're talking about trials, and then he's talking about wisdom, and now all of a sudden he's talking about rich and poor folk. Well, you got to remember, he's talking about the rich and the poor in the context of going through trials. What is he meaning here? Well, he says, number one, for the rich man, here, see, here's a, here's a truth. Trials, the tough stuff of life, has a way of leveling every person. I don't care if you have $5 or $2 million. The tough stuff hits everybody. Cancer can hit a millionaire just like it can a beggar on the streets. The loss of a child can affect those in a big house over in Raleigh or somebody living in a small house on the bad side of town. James says it levels the field. And whether you're rich or poor, you can't buy your way out of it. So James says here, for the lowly brother, for the poor brother, let him not desire. Because the, the, what, what would be the aim for the poor person? The aim would be, if I could just get this, then I would be happy. I could get out of this. I, would, I wouldn't be miserable anymore. If I could just have this amount of money. I was talking to somebody this week. In fact, it was a family member of mine. And... 
this family member of mine is just constantly back and forth of what they want to do with life and they want this and they want that and, and this has been something that they've been on before but now it's come back again well I just I just want to move to the beach I, if I could just move to the beach always looking for the next thing trying to escape the tough stuff of life with material possessions James says to the poor brother the lowly brother don't try to look to possessions to solve your problems but then he says to the rich brother you have the money don't look to your riches to try to escape the tough stuff of life. None of it's going to work. None of it's going to get you out of it. Instead, put your hope in Christ. For the rich man, put your hope in Jesus. For the poor man, put your hope in Jesus. Because that is the only thing that will get you through when life gets tough. So then, we move to verse 12. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, trials affect everyone, both rich and poor. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test of time, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Here's the awesome thing. You and I can face trials because one day we're going to receive a greater reward. Now the wording crown of life, do not picture a crown as a golden crown that would go on the head of a king or queen. The word crown could actually, this is why translations matter. This is why I'm glad we have so many translations because I'm glad it's not just only the King James or only the CSB. Or I'm glad we have other translations. This is actually better translated as a wreath that would have went on an athlete's head. So an athlete would have finished the race and they would have placed this wreath on his head to say you have run the course. And what James is saying here, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he stood the test of time he will receive the reward, the wreath saying you have run your course well. We have a better reward. I've heard it said, and I think I mentioned this on Sunday, that when you and I get to the other side, no matter what we've gone through, even the most horrific of situations, even the most horrific of situations, the moment we step into eternity, the moment, God, I mean, can you imagine the moment that you see Jesus for the first time? I don't care what you went through in this life. And, and, and that's really, I know that sounds hard for me to say. Because life really hurts sometimes. When you lose a baby, life hurts. When you get cancer, when you lose that loved one, life hurts. Life is a struggle, but can you imagine the first time you look at the one who died for you? The first time you peer into his eyes, the very first time he holds out his hands for you to embrace him in a hug, and you see the very pierced wrist of the one who was on the tree for you. All that stuff will simply fade away. For the very first time when you see him face to face, I don't think our mind will be on what we lost here on this earth. It's what we have gained in heaven. James says, for us who have ran the race well, we receive the crown of life. You've ran well. You've done good, my, faith, my faithful servant. Any comments to this point? I haven't stopped very much. Any comments to this point? Yeah. If the rain won't rise, whatever, it just they get angry. Hmm. I'm so glad they don't talk about it. Hmm. I think it means to some degree it means that in my book right here, I was being 
<laughs> oh, man. Can you imagine how frustrating it must be to live without Christ in this world? I mean, I mean, not just, I mean, yeah, you got to deal with the fact that you don't know. I mean, because everybody knows they're a sinner. I'm convinced of that. I think every person knows they're a sinner. I think every person realizes that before a holy God, they stand guilty. But then on top of that, just dealing with the junk in life. And I'm not just talking about having... You know, because they, they often accuse us as, oh, y'all just use God as a crutch. And I'm like, he ain't just my crutch. Hey, that, that dude's carrying me. Like, I mean, he's picked me up. I'm, I'm on his back. He, uh, this, this is not like I'm just leaning on Jesus. This is, he's, he has picked me up. He's doing all the work. I just wonder what it must be like to walk through life to lose a child and to not have Christ. I mean, just imagine being a, a family and having, a, having to do a funeral and to not know Christ, to, to not have that hope of eternal life, to not know that Jesus took the sting out of death. That's why Paul can say all these things. Count it all joy. Ask for wisdom in the middle of it. You have a greater reward. But then he's going to switch gears. We got just we got a few minutes here. So he's going to switch gears. And in James chapter 1, verse 13, he says this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Yet again... James, what are you like? Where are you going? Like you were talking about, you were talking about rewards. Now you're talking about sin. Remember, he's still talking about trials. He's talking about trials. So the question is, who is responsible? Now here's what he's getting at. In the midst of trials, temptation comes. Let me explain that. If I have a job that I've had for a long time. And that's been my livelihood. And all of a sudden, I come in one day. They give me the pink slip. I'm done. You've been fired. There will be some temptations there. I need to provide for my family, whether I do it immorally or not. Maybe my marriage is, is hit rock bottom. Maybe I'm looking at my marriage and my marriage is just absolutely struggling. But I've got this cute girl at work that keeps talking to me. There's a temptation there. Whatever the, te whatever the trial there is a temptation to sin. And here's what James says. I want us to be very careful. Now, number question number two. What is the relationship between testing and temptation? God will test us. But here's what James says. Let no man say. Let's read it again. Verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted in the midst of a trial, I'm being tempted by God. God can tempt no one with evil, for he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured away, when he is enticed. James says in the middle of a trial, there is room for temptation, but do not ever put the temptation on God. God will use a trial for your testing to see where you're at in your faith and to show you where you're at, but he will not tempt you because God is not evil. Be very careful. James is very clear here because he knows that the temptation would be to say, well, I'm going through this trial. My marriage is breaking down. God is sovereign and in control of all things. And if my marriage is breaking down, maybe God wants something better for me. So maybe I will go over here to that girl in the office. And, you know, th that James says, no, no, and no. God is not evil. God does not tempt anybody. God will test you, but he will not tempt you. And then listen to what he says. He says, not only is it not God, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire this reminds me of king david remember king david he's he's supposed to be with his men at battle where's he at he's on the rooftop and he's looking out over the roof and all of a sudden there's a beautiful woman and david has the opportunity to say oh no and turn around and go back inside he doesn't do that he stands there and he takes a second look 
Now the desire begins to grow. Then David actually makes the really dumb decision to go, hey, go get her. See that girl over there? Go get her. They go get her from her bath, and they bring her back over there, and David sleeps with this girl. And so now he commits sin with her. She gets pregnant, and David not only stops there, he could just come out and say, hey, and, and this is like one of his best men. David could say, hey, I'm, I, I sinned. I, I, I did something that was wrong. Let's come out about this. Let's clear the air. He doesn't do that. He tries to hide it. How's he try to hide it? Well, he puts his best man on the front line of the war. That guy gets killed off. And it's not until the prophet comes to Daniel. I mean, comes to, comes to David and he, and, and he calls him out on it. And David finally repents. You see, David was enticed. He was lured. In my redneck mind, this is how I think of this. If you've ever been fishing, every once in a while, you'll get a, if you throw that bass lure out there, if you're throwing a rubber worm, you can fish it really slow. And every once in a while, you'll get to see a, a fish that will chase. And he'll kind of look at it. And you just don't know if he's going to come after it. But what you do is you just slow it down. And you start twitching it. And then you reel it in a little bit more. And you twitch it. And you're just, just trying to get him to either agitate him or increase his desire to where he's like, I can't take it. Boom, he strikes. That's the way sin works. And especially in the midst of a trial, Satan, or, or we, can, we can put it off on Satan, just the world in general, something will be in front of us. And it's just as if somebody is sitting there with the, with the reel in their hand, putting it in front of our eyes. And we're looking, and we start getting like this, and we're saying, God, I've been deprived, I've been struggling with this thing over here. And, and you get so, and then he's, what does he say? But each person is lured and enticed, and then desire, when it conceives, gives birth to sin. Just like King David, his desire turned to sin. Our desire turns to sin. And James says, be very careful. When you're in that moment of struggle, do not say you're tempted of God. Because God tempts no one with evil. It is us who are tempted by evil. And then, so on our sheet... Trials bring opportunity for temptation. James teaches us two things. God is perfectly sinless, and we are utterly sinful. And then we get the last part. James 1, 16 to 18. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every gift and every perfect gift, every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who who whom with whom there is no variation or shadow or due to change of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be the uh, kind of first fruits of his creation last question on this sheet is god really good is god really good Yeah, tell me about it. He blesses us every single day. And, 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 but you know, in the midst of trial, the question that comes that often to our mind, and often when I, when, I, when I meet people who really have a struggle with God, the idea of God, and, I, and sometimes I believe, I, say, I think somebody, sometimes people use this as an excuse, but sometimes it really is a real question. How can God be good and allow a bunch of elementary school students to get shot up? I'm, I'm going to be honest. I, I'm not so prideful that I can't stand up here and say, when something like that happens, I, I, I kind of wonder, like, God, where were you? What's going on? I don't understand what's happening here. When I see a tornado rip through a community and destroy people's lives... God, like, what is going on there? And James is telling us, in all of life's trials, in all of life's struggles, and I'm going to be honest, I may never be able to answer that question. I may never be able to answer the question of, of why everything happens. I don't think we were intended to answer that question. And like I said, I think my first step into eternity, I don't think that'll be the question on my mind anyways. But while I'm here on earth, here's what I cling to. The scripture says that God is good. Now, what we mean by good, 
that, uh, that definition, I, I, but I do genuinely believe that God is good. But I do think God will allow certain things in our life to bring Him glory. And sometimes those things hurt. And I don't think God is sitting up there as some cynical, like, just sitting. But I think God really is good and is doing it for our benefit. We can read about this in the book of Job. And in Job, you know the crazy thing about Job is this. Job is going through all these going through. But in the first chapters of Job, heaven gets peeled back. And you and I, as the ones looking from the outside of this drama, get to look inside of heaven and see what's going on. But where's Job at? He's living on planet Earth in real time. Not knowing all the stuff that we get to see that's going on in the heavens where Satan is challenging the, the, the goodness of God. We get to read that. And Job is sitting there. He doesn't know any of that. All he knows is his life has fallen to pieces. You know, I often wonder what is happening in the spiritual world that we cannot see. What's going on? And remember on Sunday I talked about a greater reality. There's a greater reality. There's a whole world that you and I cannot see, which I think is more real than what happens down here. And I wonder what is going on if God were to open up the curtain for us and we could peel back and we could see what is happening. But here's what I'm going to stand on. Even though I can't see that, and even though I have to live in this time right now in, in time and space, I know that God's good. And I'm going to stand. I know that one, the second pillar I'm going to stand on is that God is faithful. God is good and God is faithful. And when life hurts, God is good and God is faithful. And here, let me, let me, let me prove it to you. How, do we, how can we prove that? Well, of His own will, we saw this in Ephesians over and over on Sunday, of His own will, of His own purpose, of His own will, what did God do? He brought us forth by the word of truth. Do you know how to know God is good? Did He save you? Has God saved you? There should be a whole lot of amens. Did God send Jesus on your behalf? Let's once again state this just in case we missed it on Sunday. The part of the cross that was so terrible was not the nails. The part of the cross that was so terrible was not the crown of thorns. The part of the cross that was so terrible was God's wrath upon Jesus' body where He turned away from the Son and poured His wrath on Him. And the Son looks up and He says, Father, why have You forsaken Me? That is what was so terrible about the cross. And if God was willing to do that for His Son on your behalf, then guess what? No matter what we go through on this planet that is painful and it hurts, God is good. God is really, truly Good. And I may not understand it, but he's good. Man, we're going to pray, finish this time out praying. We've got about uh, just a few minutes left. 15, I, y'all usually 7.30 is what time? I'm usually over there with the students going to like 7.45. So, uh, so 7.30, uh, I want to pray, but I want to specifically pray. Um, I hope James, first of all, was really helpful to you. Go home and read it. Read the rest of the book. Um, but I hope it was helpful to you, man. That, that first 18 verses has just blessed me. I've taught on that. Uh, this is the second time with the students. And it just blesses me every time. Um, because it helps. That's, that's one of the hardest questions as a Christian to answer. Is what do we do with real tough stuff of life? What do we do in the hard times? But uh, we have a team that is 